Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience and <clears throat> welcome to the Alcorn Immigration Law 2020 H-1B lottery update um, for our clients. Thank you so much for joining us today. We want to make your time um, very valuable. We know your time is very valuable, so we have a lot of information that we will be sharing. And our goal is to give you an overview of the H-1B process and a preview of the changes with the new electronic lottery system. And um, we will also be reserving some time at the end for your questions. So thank you so much for being on this webinar today. And if you do think of any questions along the way, you are welcome to always type them into the chat window and we will be happy to respond. So great, let's dive in. So here at Alcorn Immigration Law, we have the mission of overcoming borders, expanding opportunity, and connecting the world by practicing compassionate, cutting edge, and rigorous immigration law in service of the betterment of humanity. And the compassion is why we want to do this webinar for you today so that you can feel confident that you understand what's going on with the H-1B process. So just a little bit about who we are. Uh, I'm Sophie, I'm the founder. I had the idea for this law firm about four or five years ago when I was a mom in my kitchen with my baby and toddler. And I'm really proud that our team has grown and we've been able to support so many people from different countries all over the world. I'm joined here by my partner, Anita Kumrikian. Um, everybody in our firm is an amazing attorney, and um, Anita is an immigrant herself. I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we also have Amina Kashari, who's another attorney on our team. She, too, is an immigrant, and hopefully she'll be joining us in a little bit to help provide this presentation. And to my right is Gilbert Orozco, another amazing attorney. Hi, Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And as you know, we have many team members. Um, we hire people based on our core values of compassion and rigor and integrity and finding creative solutions to people's legal challenges so that we can help you rise above walls and borders. So I'm really proud that we have a diverse and inclusive team from all over the world who are immigrants themselves and children of immigrants, people who are married to immigrants. Basically, this is personal for all of us, so we really, really care. Okay, so let's dive in with what do you need to know about the H-1B. <clears throat> so in general, H-1B basics. You, you probably know a lot of this stuff because you're here, so you already figured out that you need an H-1B for somebody or for yourself. Um, so you've, you've gotten that far, so that's awesome. So just high-level overview, an H-1B is for somebody who is in a specialty occupation, and that basically means a professional position. And in order to qualify, you have to show that this person has a bachelor's degree or the equivalent, um, equivalent amount of experience. So Anita, if somebody dropped out of college, could they still qualify? Possibly, it all is just dependent on how much experience they have. Yeah, so the general rule of thumb is that three years of work experience in a field are equivalent to one year of education. And then basically there's this other component called the prevailing wage, which is sort of like a very specified minimum wage that applies to um, a person with this level of experience in this particular job role in this particular uh, metro metropolitan statistical area. And that's basically the government saying you have to pay this person at least so much to be able to qualify for an H-1B. All right, so why, why is there a lottery, Gilbert? Well, in the past, a lot of people were interested in the H-1B visa, and a lot of people applied for it. So now Congress has implemented a cap. Um, so every year, there are 65,000 regular H-1B visas issued, and 20,000 uh, for advanced degrees. Um, and there's also a very high demand, uh, as mentioned, in the lottery. So 
That's what we're here for, to help you overcome this obstacle and get your registration or your cap petition in. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Gilbert. Awesome. And then this, if you're listening on the phone, you can't see it, but we have this map of the world that basically excludes Africa, Latin America, and North America, and says that all the H-1Bs come from India, China, and Europe, which is not actually true. There's a lot of rounding that went into this slide, but people are often curious, and it turns out that about 55% of the H-1B holders are from India, about a third are from China, and the rest are mostly from Europe, but spread out all across the world. And something clients always want to know from me is, does the H-1B lottery depend on their country of birth? And the answer is no. <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, you don't have to deal with that until you get to the green card stage, basically. Um, and then there's ways around that as well. But for the H-1B, it's one lottery for all people from all over the world, um, regardless of what country they were born in, with the exception of that 20,000 set aside for people with master's and advanced degrees from US universities. So now, H-1B basics regarding timing and time limits, because the process is so critical. Um, I used to wonder in law school why we had to learn civil procedure and the order in which to do things, because I just wanted to get to the meat of the issue and, you know, does somebody qualify or not. But if you don't have a process, you can't get a benefit. So, Okay, Gilbert, what is the earliest possible start date for a brand new H-1B that gets selected and approved this year? October 1st would be the earliest date okay. to enter into H-1B status. Okay, so, that's, so, so don't ask us to, for a September 15th start date. Like, we simply cannot do it. It's <laughs> against the law. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the government goes on a fiscal year basis and the government fiscal year starts October 1st, so that is when they release all the new visas to be allocated for that year. Okay, so Gilbert, um, what's the typical maximum duration for somebody to stay in H-1B status? So typically, the maximum amount of time is six years. Mm -hmm. There are different ways to uh, extend beyond those six years. Um, assuming there's an approved at 140 and you're from a country where um, basically there's a backlog in green cards. Um, so you're eligible to extend beyond the six years if you're from one of those countries. Okay. And then um, Amina, what is the typical, what's the maximum duration that we can uh, request for a single H-1B for one particular time? So that would be three years. Um, every time it would be three years. Okay, great. Thank you. And then there's some weirdness with the very first H-1B because we have to do this other step called an LCA and request dates on there. So basically it means that somebody's first H-1B is probably going to be valid for like 2.75 years or two and a half years, but we can always recapture additional time later up to the six-year maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> cap gap. So if any, so we have both um, people in HR on this webinar as well as people who are working at companies or have offers to work at companies. So um, guys, let's pretend that I, you know, recently, um, not recently, um, Almost three years ago, I graduated with my master's degree in computer science, and I first had my one-year work permit called OPT, and then um, I'm currently working on my STEM OPT extension, um, but it's going to expire in July, and I really, really hope that I'm going to make it through the lottery this year. Um, what happens to me after July 15th? So, typically, um, after the petition has been submitted, um, your status uh, will be extended until October 1st. That's what's referred to as the cap gap. So you'll be eligible to continue working and remain in the U.S. Um, while your petition is being adjudicated, while USCIS gives a response on whether or not it's been approved. This only applies, though, after the physical petition has been filed. The reason I mention that is because Prior years, on, on April 1st, we would submit the physical petition. And you would be protected by the cap gap until we got a response from USCIS. 
this year, since USCIS implemented a registration, it won't apply until you have been selected and then we have filed a physical petition. Okay, so basically, I would be okay because my paperwork, if I get selected, is going to be filed before my expiration date of July 15th, in my example. Correct. But if my OPT, my final OPT were ending April 2nd, and we didn't get around to filing the petition this year until April 3rd, that actual package of papers that the government receives, I would not be included because the government has to get the person's physical stack of papers uh, before their OPT expires to be considered in cap gap. So if you have anybody who's expiring, that's something that we're going to be paying special attention to. What status, cool. what's, which status is applied to cap gap? F1. Only this is F1. for students, yes. All right. And sometimes people have J1 students working for them, but J1 does not qualify for cap gap. <clears throat> All right. So historically, um, there was this set aside of 20,000 H1Bs for people who got master's degrees or PhDs in the United States so that um, they could get an extra chance at being selected. Um, you know, it's kind of surprising and fun for me that this administration is improving our clients' well-being through these H-1B <laughs> processes. Um, but this was the first example we saw of that. And this actually kicked into effect um, like in April of 2019, so last year. So basically USCIS wanted to support students who had gone through the trouble of getting the master's degrees and PhDs in the US and give them like two bites of the apple for being included in the lottery. So they changed the order so that that group happens first and then whoever isn't selected gets another chance in the regular lottery. So that actually increased um, everybody, you know, that group's chances of getting selected. And for our clients last year, I got in trouble for this actually. Um, we had about 85% of our clients in that batch selected, which was awesome. And I gave a talk at Stanford a couple of weeks ago, and I said that it was an 85% success rate for that group. And the dean said, why are you making my students have false hope? It's actually 55%. So there you go. The national statistic <laughs> is 55%. I'm very confident about it. Um, somehow we had 85%. I don't know. Random chance. Okay. Okay. So... Now, here's all these changes that you guys are here for and that you really want to know about. So the old historical process back in the day was that anybody who wanted an H-1B had to get all of their paperwork, including the I-129 petition, the company letter, the offer letter, the transcripts, everything had to be physically received on paper by the government in the first five business days of April. And then from those people who sent it in, um, they would select which people could actually have a chance of having their H-1Bs adjudicated or even looked at. So now they're flipping it on its head. And um, we think this is actually going to happen this year. Uh, it seems to be on track. <laughs> Last year it was supposed to happen, but they pulled the plug because of the government shutdowns. It wasn't, it just wasn't happening. Um, but USCIS has been doing a lot of webinars and public information sessions. So we think, <laughs> we think they're going to be true to their word this year and actually move forward this, with this electronic registration process. And so we have a lot of screenshots and things to share with you. Um, but Anita, high level, what does this new process look like? <clears throat> so essentially the first thing that we will be doing is the electronic registration where we just file very basic information um, electronically with USCIS um, and we wait for the lottery to occur. What we do need to prove or what we need, do need to verify before we enter individuals in the electronic lottery is that it would be an approvable filing 
um, you have to qualify. Yes. We're not going to put your name in if you're not qualified because right. we don't want you getting in trouble. And to confirm that, um, we are re reviewing um, all of the beneficiaries' educational documents ahead of time to confirm that they have at least that bachelor's degree um, to proceed. Um, and then once the lottery does occur, then there is a 90-day window um, that we will be given the opportunity to actually file that full petition for those beneficiaries who were lucky enough to be selected in the electronic um, cool. registration lottery. Okay, Amina, how much is this going, how much will the government charge employers for each beneficiary? So um, it's only $10, it's a very nominal fee. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's good. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about um, that process in the slides ahead. Perfect, thank you, okay. So let's dive into that. Okay, so Gilbert, will you walk us through this timeline, please? Of course. Thank you. So as Sophie mentioned, this year, uh, petitioners or employers that are interested in hiring someone um, have to go through the electronic registration process. This process is gonna begin on March 1st of this year at noon Eastern time. And it's gonna end on March 20th at noon Eastern time. USCIS mentioned that uh, as of February 24th, employers also referred to as registrants will be allowed to create an account on myuscis.gov. Sorry, my.uscis.gov. Okay, um, so if you try to create an account now, you won't be able to. Um, you're gonna have to wait until the 24th um, and then you'll be able to create the account as a registrant. Um, but we still won't be able to create actual registrations until March 1st. Um, after we have submitted the registrations, um, USCIS will notify those people that have been selected by March 31st. Thereafter, we'll have 90 days, as Anita mentioned, to file the physical petition if you have been selected. Um, and to, re to reiterate, the earliest date that we could file the physical petition would be April 1st. That means the petition could arrive at USCIS on April 1st at earliest. Okay. So February 24th is a Monday, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Log on sometime that week to create your account if you're an employer. March 1st is a Sunday. I don't think we need you guys to log in from home on Sunday at noon. I would say, I mean, you can if you're really paranoid, but I think it's going to be fine if you wait and you do it during your normal work hours um, starting the next week. I think we just all have to be prepared that there might be hiccups to the system and the amount of traffic that it will be serving, especially on March 2nd and March 3rd. But you know, the good news is that this is a 20 day window and um, Gilbert, there's no advantage to getting in on the first versus the 19th, right? Everybody's equal. Correct. I'm going to quote okay. USCIS. It's not a race. Okay. Um, so if we enter your registration on March 19th or March 20th before noon Eastern time, you'll have the same likelihood of being selected. Great. Okay. And so, <clears throat> Now, this, you know, this ties into another thing about the two different um, service levels that we're offering our clients. So we'll be talking about, you know, the difference if you're only doing the electronic registration at this time versus if you're choosing to prepare the full petition. But in either case, um, unless they pull the plug on the whole system, which I don't think is likely, and they, they did say they would get a lot of notice if they were actually going to cancel the program. Correct. Right. So there's a lot of groups and associations that are concerned about whether or not USA is going to go through with the registration process. Um, the service did mention that if there is the event that they pull the plug for any reason, they will give us ample time to prepare the physical petitions and submit yeah. them. Okay. So basically, we'll find out through this electronic system that we're about to show you with screenshots, who is getting selected. And then for anybody who's selected, the, we, the government will permit us to deliver the entire paper-based traditional H-1B package of documents anytime between April 1st and June 30th of 2020. 
And that's also not a race, right? Correct. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay. So this is pay.gov. Um, you're not going to need to create a separate pay.gov account, which is nice because I had to do that for global entry. It was <laughs> really challenging. Um, and they're going to, you know, accept um, checking accounts, savings accounts. Credit to, card, debit card. To add to that, yeah. um, we'll be doing most of the heavy lifting here for you guys. Um, and that also includes paying the, the fee um, and submitting the application. We're going to go through that process right now, how to set up your account, what you'll be responsible for, and um, we'll briefly touch on what we're going to be doing on our end um, so that we're all on the same page. Cool. Thank you. All right. Okay, Gilbert, I'm going to turn this part over to you and you can try to reach the button. <laughs> Alrighty, so uh, here are some screenshots of how to create your account. So in order to create your account, um, you're going to go to the USCIS website. If you look at the top, there's a little arrow pointing to tools. You're going to click on tools and then you're going to go to where it says my USCIS. Once you click on my USCIS, it's going to take you to this page. Um, here's where you're going to create your account. So you're going to click at the top where it says sign up. And it's going to take you to this page where you're going to click again, sign up, unless you have already created an account. So once you're here, you're going to create a password. Um, and it's going to tell you how strong the password is. And it's going to ask you to confirm the password. Um, just to make sure that other people can't log in or I'm kind of impressed that they're doing like modern things like showing password strength and yeah. requesting it twice and, and this whole thing auto saves right like once you're you're in it yes yeah yes. so that'll be nice too okay. um, there's also a two-step verification method um, so once you've created your account uh, you can verify uh, that it's truly you by one of these options, either an email, a uh, text message, or download an app, and then you can verify through that app. Then you're gonna have to enter or respond to some uh, questions just to implement for the security on your account. Favorite flavor of ice cream? <laughs> What's your sign? Correct, correct. What's your moon sign? So this is very important right here, and I'd like for everyone to pay attention. Um, when you're able to create an account on February 24th, you're going to have these three options when creating the account type. For employers, you're going to select the third option at the bottom where it says, I am an H&B registrant. That makes no sense. That is correct. <laughs> because if, you, if USAS had not told us otherwise, uh, we would believe that the top option would be the correct one because it says I'm an applicant petitioner or requester. Um, but USAS said, no, select the third option. Okay, so companies select, I am an H-1B registrant. Correct. And we will be emailing you these instructions in writing at the right time so you can refer to that as well. Correct. <laughs> Great. So once you reach uh, this stage, um, you'll be given two options file a registration or enter a representative passcode. Since we're gonna be doing the heavy lifting for you and entering all the data, you're gonna just wait until we tell you, hey, we've done entering the data, we've uh, finished the registrations and we would like you to review it. In order for you to review it, we're gonna generate uh, a passcode that we're then gonna share with you in order to access the application, that registration. Once we share it with you, you're gonna click enter representative passcode and submit it. Once you submit it, you'll be uh, able to review the G28, which is one of the forms that allows us to represent you um, as your attorneys, um, as well as, oh, I got a little ahead of myself. You're gonna continue reviewing the G28, <laughs> um, picking next, right? So you accept to review it, um, you sign here for a statement, uh, just acknowledging that you've hired us as your attorneys and how you want to receive notifications. And, and we recommend that, well, what do we recommend? <laughs> um, 
So, you know, here there's different options here about who gets the original notices. Um, we want to be receiving that so that we can support you, scan everything, keep our eye on everything, make sure it's tracked and that nothing slips through the cracks. Correct. So once you've selected that and sign, you'll click next again, um, and you'll click submit G28. There's another little page that talks more briefly about the H1B registration process, yeah. uh, the fee. It's just general information that's already made available to the public. And I want to highlight something here, which is that we're not going to do this, but don't go off on your own and submit multiple H1Bs for the same person. That will cancel all of that individual's registrations. So we're just doing one registration for one person. Correct. And there's also a tool that USAS provided to make sure that duplicates aren't submitted. And I'll get to that uh, in one of the next slides. Um, so once you click next, it's actually going to take you to the details um, about yourself as, a, as an employer, uh, that beneficiary, you're going to review it and then click next. So it doesn't need that much um, beneficiary information. Correct. They're, it's, it's they're very, not going into address history or marriages or schools. It's just like, who are you? Correct. Passport, country, name, date, date of birth. birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here you'll be given the option to either accept or decline uh, the h b registration that we've prepared for you. Again, you authorize uh, this statement and you click next. Then you sign again. <clears throat> and then you finish and send to representative. Which is us. Correct. Um, so once you click send, the ball is back in our court. We'll uh, then be responsible for submitting the registration and paying the fees and informing you that the registration has been submitted. Now the tool that I mentioned was this page right here. So instead of clicking and going down to the screen to see who's been submitted, who hasn't been submitted, where we are with each beneficiary, you can generate a CSV file and use Excel or different, uh, different program to download a list of employees or beneficiaries that your company is sponsoring an h petition for and see where they are in the process. Um, see if they've already been submitted, if they're in progress. Um, and we'll also have the ability to download this, this uh, report. Uh, so we'll also be tracking where we are with each individual uh, registration. Cool. Great. So Amina, what are some things that companies who want to be proactive um, can start doing now just to be on top of the ball for all of this? So to be proactive, we would need some information from both the beneficiary as well as the company. Um, for the registration process, like Gilbert was explaining, it's really not a lot of information, um, but we do want to have um, some preliminary information. So for the candidate, we need things like um, transcripts, diplomas, the, uh, their resume, um, as well as past immigration documents. And we'll determine if we need an equivalent uh, education uh, evaluation at that point. Um, and we'll let the company and the candidates know if that's something that we'll need to do. Um, for the company, we need things like the FEIN number. Um, and we need things like the job title, a little bit more information about the, um, the job itself. Um, and some um, preliminary company documents, um, information like their website, marketing materials, uh, pitch deck, as well as tax information. Yeah, and we help, you know, uh, we serve a lot of professionals in the technology field at a variety of different types of companies. So the documents we need if you're at an early stage startup are going to be different than the documents that we'll need if you're at, you know, an established multinational, but um, Gilbert and Nina and Nita and I will all be in touch with you directly to make sure that we have exactly what we need so that you have the strongest, um, so you're, you know, we're helping you put your, your strongest foot forward. Cool. 
Now, here's another question that we historically had to figure out before April 1st. Um, now, if you're just doing the electronic registration, we have a little bit more time to figure this out. This is good for everybody to know, to know about. There's a difference between a change of status and consular processing. And you want to speak to that a little bit? Please. Absolutely. So an individual would file for a change of status if they're in the United States and have valid status here in the U.S. Um, where they would be changing their status from whatever status that they have, such as um, F1 or OPT, over to H1B um, once they are approved um, and their time on October 1st hits. Um, consular processing is for those who are not yet in the country, um, who will be traveling internationally um, or who will be coming to the United States once they do have um, their H1B um, visa issued and uh, approved and issued in hand. Cool, thank you. So most often you're going to be sponsoring people who are already working for you in OPT and so they're here and they're probably just gonna be staying here. Um, some of you have candidates who are in other countries and they would definitely need to go the consular processing route Sometimes we have people who are working in international business development or there's important needs for them to attend conferences or they have an alien relative, travel might be necessary between now and October. So let us know if there's any mandatory travel that needs to happen so that we can make appropriate plans for that. Um, it could be that we need to select consular processing or it could be that we could try to squeeze in the person's travel um, before we actually file the petition. So there's some different ways we can go about that. Okay, <clears throat> so another thing to just sort of keep in mind as we move forward is that the job, the job matters, the job title, the job classification, and the job duties matter. So Gilbert, could you tell us a little bit about this slide and what's on here for people on the phone and what it means. Yeah, so I'm sure as you guys have noticed, uh, we've received a lot of requests for evidence uh, in the immigration field under the current administration. Um, there's been a lot of pushback. Um, and part of it is just the administration itself. And we've also been able to identify uh, specific job positions that have been challenged more often than others. Um, so this is the list of those positions um, that have been challenge more often than others. Um, as you guys may be aware of, so when we receive the job description, the job title, the salary, um, we then classify it um, using an SOC code. That, the government system. That, yeah, the government uses to classify specialty occupations. Um, and those lists right here uh, show those, those occupations. Yeah, so basically, Okay, so commercial industrial designers, construction managers, probably not you guys, um, computer systems analysts, data analysts, especially for business intelligence, financial analysts, management analysts, market research analysts, network and computer systems administrators, operations research analysts, and software developers have all been challenged recently. So, you know, when we're working with you guys on the actual H-1B petition itself, um, that's where we can evaluate your job description and job duties and um, help classify the job appropriately. And obviously, we'll, we will keep in mind that um, these categories uh, have faced additional scrutiny. So, you know, where possible and legally appropriate, we can recommend alternative categorizations for you. Okay, so here is an overview of what we think the timeline is <laughs> moving forward. So you guys are super on the ball because it's now and you've already retained your H1B council, which is us, and you've already decided who you're going to sponsor and you've already made the choice, um, HR has made the choice if you will be only pursuing the electronic registration this year or going old school a little bit more conservative more investment of time and resources and preparing the full petition now um, as, a, as a backup in case something goes wrong with the lottery um, or you know so that you have everything ready to go on April 1st for somebody who was selected. If I was a company and I selected just the electronic lottery 
registry? Is there a cutoff for when I can change my decision of it being just electronic registration to being a full position? So we need some time to prepare the full petition. So I would probably suggest that if you could let us know in the next two weeks by March 1st, that would really help us help you. We're happy to make that switch, but these um, petitions take several weeks to pull together and there's various steps that are involved. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, okay, so February 24th, that's when um, employers can log on and create your account at my.uscis.gov. The electronic registration period is March 1st to the 20th. The government is going to select people and Gilbert, what, like on a rolling basis between March 20th and 31st? It's a lottery. It's a lottery, so. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows which process we're going to use. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> but like, it's a computer. It's a random number generator. Like, we have supercomputers now. Like, you would theoretically think that they would know everybody within like 30 seconds, right? But there's a possibility that it we think that it will just take time for the government to let the those who were selected in the lottery yeah. that they were selected. I mean, you guys or clients can tell us how easily automatable that is. But um, if you ever want to do pro bono work to volunteer for the government to read to their systems, <laughs> maybe we can hook you up. <laughs> okay, so if you are selected, then April 1st to June 20th, 30th is the you know, one quarter 90 day window for which um, we need to prepare and send the full H-1B petition package to the government. Um, and then, you know, jumping forward to October 1st, that's always the first possible start date. There's a lot of variation that we don't really know what's going to be happening in, you know, end of spring, summer, beginning of fall. Um, I mean, like last year, right? There, there all the, they had to spend so much time sending back all the rejected petitions, which was you know like a forest of paper. Um, but they don't have to do that this year, so maybe they'll be more efficient with the adjudications. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with premium processing and whether whether they will turn it off again. It's currently on. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the administration has had a high rate of requests for evidence, and so we don't really know when those will start trickling in. But in general, we would have 60 to 90 days to respond to those. So what happens if I have an employee who has an H-1B that's still pending on October the 2nd? Can my employee start working because it's after <clears throat> October the 1st, or do I have to wait for that H-1B to be approved? This is such a good question. Okay. If they have another valid non-immigrant status with work permission, they just keep working in the old status, like F1 OPT or F1 STEM OPT, until the H-1B gets approved. Using that cap. Yeah. Using, using the, the work permit from the unexpired OPT. If they're on cap gas and it expired in June, July 15th, like my prior example, mm -hmm. and the thing is still pending on October 2nd, well, you know, in September, we're going to urge you to add on premium processing if you haven't already to speed it up to try to avoid this situation. But there were some years when the government wasn't allowing premium processing at that time of year. And basically, people on cap gap had to stop working. Their last day was September 30th. They had to stay in the country because it was a change of status and we didn't want to jeopardize that. They weren't allowed to work. So unpaid leave of absence if anybody's doing a change of status on cap cap and we're still waiting on October 1st. Is that it? Um, we have a few minutes left, so if you have questions, if you could start sharing them in the chat window, that would be great. And we just have a little bit more material that, that we'll be going through. So, you know, we have a lot more information than we did just a few weeks ago. The government's been really proactive, but um, Gilbert, what are the remaining questions? One of the biggest concerns is whether this new system is going to crash. It's uh, USCIS's first attempt to do an electronic registration, and we don't know. We don't know if it's going to crash because there's going to be a lot of people entering data on the first day that it's open, or if there's some bugs that haven't been fixed yet. Uh, but USCIS has said that if it crashes or there's any issue with the 
registration system that they'll let us know and give us further guidance to file the physical petition if necessary. Thank you. Okay. So now real briefly, um, some of you are only doing the electronic filing. So we're going to support you to register your candidates into the March electronic lottery. And then we're not going to start working to prepare the full petitions for anybody who's selected until you actually give us your go ahead. So especially for very early stage companies that don't have a lot of resources, um, this, this can be the right way to go. Um, alternatively, some of you have elected to just go old school and prepare the full petition in advance of April um, to guard against any glitches and to just have everything ready to go on April 1st. So that is the safest option, but it's, it's, it's more time and money now, so that might not be right for everybody. If you do want to upgrade, you're welcome to let us know within the next week or two and we can still accommodate you. Um, and then just other things to be aware of. Uh, it's not just the money. This is your time. This is everybody's time because we need all this information. Um, and, you know, for people who are selected, government filing fees will become due. Um, you'll need to ensure that you can pay the prevailing wage. Last year we had somebody arguing about it. 72%, 72 cent an hour uh, raise for somebody. So hopefully you can be a little bit more flexible than that if it's necessary. Um, for people with bachelor's degrees from uh, universities abroad, we are gonna need your um, degrees evaluated. So we would actually wanna start that with the service now and make sure we have everything translated that we need. Okay, um, so this is our contact information, but you, you, you know how to reach us. We're already in touch. Um, there's some additional, um, articles that we have online and in TechCrunch, um, my article about these H1B changes was published a few weeks ago, so that's available for you. Um, but Gilbert, um, what does it look like on that portal if somebody gets selected or if somebody doesn't get selected? How does, how's that going to appear? So as of March 31st, if you've been selected, you'll get a selection notice uh, letting you know that you've been selected. The selection notice can be either physical or through email, and you have the choice of whether you want to receive the physical notice or uh, an email. If you have not been selected, this is where it gets a little tricky compared to prior years. Prior years, we would wait until we receive the physical denial, the physical petition being denied, not selected. This year, we will not know that you have not been selected until October or September 31st, meaning that you're gonna see a status update saying in progress or submitted until September 31st if you have not yet received a select notification. Okay, thank you. Um, I do see a question which was about electronic filing only. Um, and so yes, the government is charging $10 per registrant and then our legal fees are separate and we're happy to discuss that more with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, let's see, Amina or Anita, any other questions that you would like to add, comments, observations? I believe we have some questions for the participants. Okay, in the Q&A portion, here we go. Great. Thank you so much for the questions. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, you're always welcome to ask any questions. You're welcome to email us anytime. We are happy to schedule uh, a call to go through your questions. We want to make sure that you have everything that you need. And um, we thank you so much for participating. Um, it's really, um, <clears throat> it's, you know, it's really a pleasure to serve you and to support you with this process. We know that there have been a lot of changes and, um, oh, and I do see, okay, so if you need to go, we totally understand because we're at time, but uh, we do have the panel open with the additional questions. So 
the candidate is planning to travel during any step in this process, will there be an issue? Um, there could be an issue, so if you already know that somebody must travel, please let Gilbert or Amina know right away what those travel plans are, and then we can make an uh, individual determination of whether this travel is going to work and let you know what the risks are involved. Um, is there any part of the fees that the beneficiary can pay for? Um, the only thing that it's permissible for a beneficiary to pay for is later if it's selected and filed and the company doesn't do the premium processing upgrade, that is something that the, that the employee, the beneficiary could pay for. Other stuff don't, um, it's against the law. Um, okay, are there any penalties if a candidate is selected and you don't go through with the filing? Uh, Gilbert, the answer to that is no. <laughs> Thank you. Next, can more than one company submit a registration for an employee? So my legal understanding is yes, if it's two separate companies with two totally separate job positions. Um, I think the software is only gonna remove duplicates filed by a single company. Correct. So two separate companies with two separate FEIN can petition for the same person, but the same company or a subsidiary of a parent company and the parent company cannot petition for the same person. Great, thank you. Um, okay, what if, what if the employee quits the job after the lottery selection and before the application? Um, then the company doesn't have to follow through with the petition, there won't be a penalty, that person is not going to be getting an H-1B for you. Next, does the 90-day rule apply to the F1 to H1B process. Um, the 90 day rule is where if you get an F1, in this example, if you get an F1 visa and you come in and with night, within 90 days, you apply for a change of status to another non-immigrant status, um, you could have visa issues in the future. Um, talk to us. If you're concerned this might apply to you, it's pretty rare and we just need to look at the specific dates because this is about the date of visa issuance, not about your date of entry into the United States. And then our last question, um, for foreign university graduates, uh, do you only need an English translation of the transcript or does USCIS evaluate the accreditation of the institution? Um, this is why we would like you to go to one of the vendors who we can refer you to to get um, an educational equivalence evaluation. Um, those people are experts in the different universities and if they're accredited and then they will give their stamp of approval saying if this is equivalent to a U.S. bachelor's degree. Yay, thanks for all the great questions. We just got through those. Okay, well as always we are here for you. Um, we're so grateful for the opportunities to support you through this process, and we hope we can make it as fun, easy, quick, and painless <laughs> as possible. So with that, uh, we will head out and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.